my name is Nisa Mackey and I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs here at the Walker Art Centre. Thank you for joining us for these two talks um, that are being presented in connection with the exhibition Jimmy Durham at the Centre of the World. The exhibition was curated uh, by Anne Elgood, Chief Cur Curator at the Hammer Museum, who is with us today, um, and was organised at this venue by Vincenzo De Bellis, Curator of Visual Arts uh, here at the Walker Art Centre. I'm about to introduce Shanna Ketchum Heap of Birds, uh, who will be delivering a short lecture on the impact of Durham's own critical writing on global indigenous discourse. She will also be speaking about his written collaborations with the late writer, curator, and editor, Jean Fisher. Following this, we'll take a short break, about 15 minutes or so, and return to hear a lecture by Edgar Heap of Birds, introduced by Rory Wackamup, artist and director of All My Relations Gallery. There'll be a short question time for both talks at the end of the entire session. Shana Ketchum Heap of Birds is a citizen of the Dinner Navajo Nation and is a PhD candidate at Middlesex University London uh, in the School of Art and Design. She's published across a wide range of platforms, including Third Text, Critical Perspectives on Contemporary Art, Conundrum, uh, the Journal of Contemporary Aboriginal Artists and Aesthetics, for the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, uh, for the Hugo Boss Prize uh, connected to the Guggenheim Museum, uh, Manifestations, uh, a journal entitled New Native Art Criticism. Um, and she's also lectured nationally and internationally on contemporary issues in Native American art at places such as Goldsmiths University London, the University of Strasbourg, France, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Maryland Institute College of Art, uh, Cal Arts, um, Bandung Institute of Technology in Java, Indonesia, and at Dinner College in uh, Sali, uh, Arizona. Since 2007, Ketchum Heap of Birds has been an instructor in the Native American Studies Department at the University of Oklahoma in uh, Norman, where she is affiliate faculty in the Women and Gender Studies Program and the Center of Social Justice. So uh, please join me in welcoming Shana. Well, uh, Thank you, Nissa, for that nice introduction. And I want to start out with, uh, before I begin to explain the title of my talk, because it refers to the art writings of my PhD supervisor, Jean Fisher, who passed away last December. The phrase, speaking truth to power, refers to Edward Said's intellectual who challenged dom dominant discourses to privilege the voices in the margins. Fisher exemplified this spirit in her life's work because she saw art as a valuable tool for self-representation, which for the dispossessed peoples offers a possibility of reclaiming selfhood and cultural renewal. Her writings about native art since the 1980s resituated the debates and forged a discourse centered upon an understanding of art making as the material realization of a philosophical response to the world. In the recent issue of Guise Magazine, a publication from Canada, the main topic discussed is decolonization with a focus on what is termed contemplative cultural resistance. Editor and grassroots activist Leah Gazan defines decolonization from an indigenous perspective as reconnecting back to land and place and an identity that was defined prior to colonization, often through spirit or ceremony. Many of the essays in the magazine draw parallels between the colonization of indigenous peoples worldwide, such as in South Africa, North America, South America, Australia, Palestine, to only name a few. What becomes of paramount importance is the issue of land ownership. Activist Sylvia McAdam outlines this issue by discussing the poverty and fourth world conditions of North American reservation systems organized by colonial legislative acts, such as the Doctrine of Discovery in the US and the Racist Indian Act in Canada. 
It has been in my view and experience that contemporary Native artistic practices and strategies offer powerful critiques of institutional structures that continue to disempower indigenous peoples. For example, since the 1960s, Native American and, and Aboriginal artists have been creating work that not only expresses their personal visions, but also functions as an act of resistance against a marginalizing art world. In fact, against the backdrop of increasing Indian activism in the 1960s, most artwork made in that time period, and even up to the present, involved tactics and st artistic strategies that challenged the status quo with interventions to push the boundaries of an art world with a limited field of vision. In 1988, Cheyenne and Arapaho artist Edgar Heapaburge installed a billboard in Derry, Northern Ireland with these words printed on it. Peace, unite, respect, Irish homelands, no more kingdoms, no more kings. The text-based public art intervention was created for the Orchard Gallery to memorialize the deaths of 26 unarmed Irish civilians in the Bloody Sunday Massacre of 1972. As those Irish civilians marched and protested peacefully through the Bogside or Republican Catholic neighborhoods, armed British soldiers shot them. As a resident of, of London in the late 1970s, Heepa Birds was well aware of the complex history and dual narrative of Derry, or what's called London Derry, a city located on the border between Northern Ireland in the UK and the Republic of Ireland. To Heepa Birds, the billboard in Derry processed the idea of a kingdom and was inspired by the popular phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire which of course refers to British imperialism. In fact, when Heba Birds was installing the piece in 88, he was quite aware of the military presence as British troops still patrolled the city with assault rifles in hand. In his essay titled A Central Margin, published in the Decade Show catalog of 1990, self-described Cherokee artist Jimmy Durham praised the specificity of Heba Birds' billboard and proclaimed, and I quote, the dairy public appreciated the obvious solidarity and proper anti-British in Ireland sentiment. Durham goes on to contextualize Heath of Burge's word pieces by stating that they might be compared superficially to the work of Barbara Kruger, Jenny Holzer, or other artists who use words and public imagery. However, there is nothing derivative in what he does, Durham says, and if he has not received the critical attention he deserves, he cannot easily be ignored. Durham's untitled installation in Derry was outside the city walls on a bank that leads down to the Republican bog side, where he raised a pole that you can see in this image, which was topped by a carved wood surveillance camera and a pair of car wing mirrors facing the British military surveillance mast sighted inside the city walls, monitoring the bog side. According to scholar Jean Fisher, these observations of surveillance and control are indicative of Durham's broader artistic and writing practices to subtly disclose dehumanizing manipulations of power in the world around us. Furthermore, Durham's work often focuses on the socio-political conditions of the people he has encountered in his long career. As Fisher puts it, and I quote, wherever in Eurasia Durham has been invited, he has assiduously responded by engaging with the language, stories, and culture of place alongside its natural inhabitants. As an artist and writer since the 1970s, Durham finished art school in Geneva, Switzerland. Before returning to the US in 1973 to become a full-time organizer for the American Indian Movement and residing on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Since 87, Durham has lived outside the US and actively seeks non-American context to create and exhibit his art. In an essay about the history of the Orchard Gallery, 
Art historian Gabriel, Gabriel N. Gee defines the gallery's artistic program as aimed toward exhibiting a range of practitioners from diverse backgrounds who produce works both about the specific urban context of dairy and to reach beyond its location. Durham and Heap of Birds produced interventions that were successful in carrying out the Orchard Gallery's goal of exhibiting artwork that addressed the Northern Irish socio-political and paramilitary situation, while at the same time offering a critique of Western representations. Much like his contemporaries, Durham was quite familiar with the U.S. mainstream art world and his exhibition practices throughout what is called the postmodern period, namely the late 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Durham's timely essay titled A Central Margin appeared in the Decade Show catalog along a very, alongside a very diverse crowd of artists. The Decade Show brought together more than 200 works by 94 artists of Hispanic, Asian, African American, Native American, and European heritage. This collaborative project of the Museum of Contemporary Hispanic Art, the New Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Studio Museum in Harlem sought to examine the decade of the 1980s in terms of artistic production that went beyond what one director, Marsha Tucker, called, and I quote, a very white, very male, very mainstream view of what happened during the 80s. These artists, according to curator Sharon F. Patton, zeroed in on the most retrogressive behavior characterizing the 1980s, phobia about difference. Their agendas as expressed through their works is quite clear and deliberate. That is, to vigilantly maintain and insist upon cultural diversity in American society and the world. Although the Decade Show and later the 1993 Whitney Biennial showcased art informed by identity politics and enjoyed a degree of popularity, they were subsequently lumped into the category of multiculturalism, as one scholar put it, and many of them were rejected for an alleged commodification of identity politics or for assumed essentialism. In his essay for the catalog, Durham sums up the New York art world during this time period from the perspective of the native artists. He says, and I quote, they began to celebrate the death of modernism and the birth of a new pluralism. As others have pointed out, for the most part, this pluralism has meant that white boys are free to do whatever they want, and then a few white women, end quote. The new pluralism that Durham speaks of is described by scholar Craig Owens as a condition of postmodern culture's crisis of authority, specifically of the authority vested in Western European culture and its institutions. Owens posits a one-dimensional view of the postmodern age by stating that since the mid-1950s, the hegemony of European civilization was drawing to a close and the beginning of a new postmodern age was characterized by the coexistence of different cultures that encountered one another by means other than the shock of domination and conquest. It was during this general movement in the arts known as postmodernism that one witnessed a rise in the number of opportunities for native artists to not only exhibit their work, but also organize entire shows with native artists about native content. Yet, as Durham put it, and I quote, he says, there is an ocean between showing and being included in the discourse. Durham's dismay with the postmodern movement and its ideals have been echoed by other non-white artists who acknowledge its multicultural vision, but are aware of its othering capabilities and cultural essentialism. Quite rightly, Durham cites artist and writer Rashid Ariyin, who wrote in the London-based journal Third Text, and I quote, when the others began to demand their share of the modern pie, modernism became postmodernism. Now there is a Western culture and other cultures located within the same contemporary space. Situating the concept of the others as mere victims of dominant culture will be to deny other cultures their ability to question their domination and to liberate themselves from it. 
For many years before and after the Decade Show in 1990, non-white artists and writers from the U.S. and abroad continued the struggle against what Ariane termed the Eurocentric production, dissemination, and legitimization of knowledge. Similarly, Jean Fisher critiqued postmodern debates because she believed that the position from which an artist speaks is not reducible to identity, which gives us no purchase on the issue of political agency as the power to act and affect cultural change. Furthermore, Fisher states that agency should not be thought of in terms of individual will, but as a field of activity in which subjects and communities map and position themselves with varying degrees of mobility relative to relations of power. Contemporary Native American artists from the US and Canada have been creating work that not only expresses their personal visions, but also functions as an act of resistance against a marginalizing art world. The political turmoil and fight for civil rights among the minority populations in the US has been cited by many Native artists, including Durham, Heap of Birds, Richard Ray Whitman, George Longfish, and a list of many others, as the impetus for addressing the socio-political realities of being Indian in the United States with their artwork. Often playfully described as a godfather of Native art because he was such a big supporter of it, Seneca artist George Longfish collaborated on an exhibition titled Confluences of Tradition and Change, 24 American Indian Artists in 1981. And there's a list of some of the artists in that catalog. This exhibition traveled to several locations, including the Museum of the Southwest in Midland, Texas, Brunier Gallery at Iowa State University, and the Gallery of the American Indian Community House in New York City. According to the catalog, the major emphasis of the show was to bring together the work of artists who, while retaining a deep respect for their heritage and artistic and cultural traditions, have departed from the cliches and stereotypes popularly found in traditionalist and revivalist Indian art today. The stereotypical art style just described is something that is often found in major cities of the Southwest because they are defined by the tourist market. In an interview with Edgar Heepaber, the artist stated that the exhibit, Confluences of Tradition and Change, served as an important marker of what was possible for Native artists outside of the Southwest, market-driven scene of the tourist industry found in places like Santa Fe, New Mexico, or Scottsdale, Arizona. To him, it seemed that any Native artist, not pandering to the market by creating decorative Bambi art, was considered a political artist back in the 1980s and even to this day. That is, any form of self-expression that communicates to the viewer and not the market is an important strategy toward achieving agency as an artist. One artist that exhibited in confluences of tradition and change that caught most people's eye was Billy Sosa, War Soldier. War Soldier's print titled Bill 9054 from 1978 references a bill of the same name that was introduced on September 12, 1977 into the House of Representatives by a Washington State Congressman in an attempt to reverse the course of federal Indian policy back to termination. The bill, euphemistically named Native American Equal Opportunity Act, in effect called it for the termination of tribal sovereignty and reflected the attitudes of many white Americans in the Pacific Northwest Coast in the aftermath of the Bolt decision that upheld Native American fishing rights in the region. Set against the background of the American flag, one can read the text of Bill 9054 in the lower left-hand corner, while the large stenciled words of U.S. government, spies, and FBI off Indian land provides the viewer with context. The mirrored images of two eagles, one black and one white, are covered with red blood droplets from wounds caused by assault rifles. And here's a detail of that image. 
war soldier's commentary that you can see here explains the death of what he says, our powerful, our powerful brother, the eagle, from high-powered telescopic rifle drunk white men, anti-Indian groups who have no respect left in their lives. War soldier then writes, a few goddamned Indians care enough to realize what the government is doing. Few goddamned Indians are resisting. With his art, war soldier emphasized resistance by including the famous image of Geronimo and stating, it is a comfort to know that our grandfathers resisted and fought against the white eyes and blue coats with long knives. Obviously, as one writer observed in this essay for the catalog, War Soldier uses a virulent graffiti collage format to express his frustrations and anger with the injustices of government and society. As an art student during the 1970s at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, War Soldier's artwork was indicative of the educational philosophy of the recently formed IAIA of 1962. Previous to this time, from 1932 to 1960, the Institute of American Indian Art was known as the Santa Fe Indian School and recognized for its painting program called The Studio, where art educator Dorothy Dunn taught several Native American students who became well-known artists. It is generally believed that Dunn's theories about Native American art influenced what was accepted and rejected by critics, galleries, collectors, museums, and the general public for decades, especially in the American Southwest. Often described as flat decorative painting devoid of perspective and shading, Dunn insisted on subject matter that lacked strife, modern life ways, or conflict. It was not until the birth of IAIA in 1962 that a Native American art students had the freedom to paint controversial subjects in their own styles against what some believe to be the stifling effect of the studio and the patronage system of which it was a part. It was during this period of increasing Indian activism in the 1960s that the new director of IAIA, Cherokee Lloyd Kiva New, encourage student exploration of their identity and total life experiences, both traditional and modern, as war soldiers' print entails. The lesson of the studio years at Santa Fe Indian School was that regardless of Dunn's influence, Native American artists in the US and Canada wanted to control the construction of their cultural identities rather than having them controlled by others. It is in this context of the 1960s that Native artists reappropriated their voices, identities, selves, and used art as a practice in the decolonizing process toward cultural continuity. Like Durham, War Soldier participated in the Indian activism of the 1970s, including the takeover of the replica of the Mayflower at Plymouth Rock on Thanksgiving Day in 1970. Also the reclaiming of Alcatraz Island and the takeover of the Bureau of Indian Affairs Building, Department of the Interior, in Washington, D.C. in 1971. From 1966 to 73, War Soldier could not attend his own exhibitions because he was a federal fugitive and served time in prison for his radical activism. The American Indian movement, like other movements of the 1960s, allowed many artists to create cultural expressions with an overarching critique of several aspects of US society. These critiques were radical in the sense that they attempted to get to the root of oppression and the current system of gross inequality. The impetus for minority political activism can be traced to the 40s and 50s because these decades forged a fight for mostly black civil rights and the emergence of AIM in 1968, especially with the occupation of Alcatraz Island in 69 to 71. In her book, American Indian Ethnic Renewal, Red Power and the Resurgence of Identity and Culture, 
Joanne Nagel discusses the formation of the Red Power Movement during the Civil Rights Era America and how although there were some very real differences between the problems facing American Indians and those confronting black Americans in the 1960s, we cannot discount the importance of the civil rights movement for the emergence of red power. For example, Nagel points out that red power borrowed from civil rights organizational forms, rhetorics, and tactics, but modified them to meet the specific needs and symbolic purposes of Indian grievances, targets, and locations. The black lunch counter sit-in became the tribal fish-in. Black power became red power. In Ames police monitoring activities in Minneapolis paralleled those of the Black Panthers in Oakland. In moments of social upheaval, artists generate large-scale aesthetic and creative outpourings, and IAIA was instrumental and bringing together a large number of students from various tribal backgrounds and locations to participate as agents of social change. While some Indian artists were out on the street until the mid-1970s, others were making interventions in museums or gallery spaces by forming exhibitions like We the People in 1987 that, according to scholar Jean Fisher, would explore the problems of presenting Native American art in a social climate that has little competence to see beyond its limited field of vision. We the People was organized by Jimmy Durham and Jean Fisher and exhibited at Artist Space in New York City. It was comprised of over 20 visual artists and included musicians, poets, writers, and a video program. The title refers to the English translation of the names that different tribal peoples call themselves and reflects the diversity of Indian country within the U.S. borders. Artists came from very different places like Oklahoma or New York City or from rural and urban backgrounds, but most likely shared the same experiences resulting from colonization and most definitely suffered white misconceptions about their identities both past and present. As Fisher outlines in her essay for the catalog, the main concern of We the People was to pose questions about what constitutes Native American identity and ask the question, and I quote, how far is this conditioned by white myths and expectations imposed on them? And to what extent do the latter continue to serve white politics and impede Native demands for self-determination? Former IAIA student and Yuchi artist Richard Ray Whitman's mixed media piece for We the People, titled Relocation Assimilation, depicts some of these issues as a viewer is confronted with texts and photographs of displaced street chiefs in an urban setting. Photographs of the homeless men are juxtaposed with texts such as Native is Pain and Your Part which is a clipping from one of Heap of Birds' word pieces published in the book Sharp Rocks. The phrase is used to outline Whitman's portrayal of native life, who happens to be opposite of the romantic stereotypical image of the Plains Indian who wears a war bonnet popularized by Hollywood. Instead, a newspaper clipping about murdered Indian men is contrasted with other texts and images that reveal a candid, sensitive portrayal of native life in the contemporary life of urban settings on reservations or Indian lands as it really exists. Whitman describes his street chief existence as isolating. Whether on the reservation or in the city, it's a lifestyle that's often overlooked and ignored because the boredom, pain, frustration, poverty of our lives is harsh, unattractive, and unremarkable. Therefore, the quote, native is pain and your part, challenges the person wanting to claim Indian ancestry based on romantic stereotypes with the task of also owning the social ills and oppressive forces shaping Indian life in the 20th century. The Street Chief Photographic Series is one of Whitman's most significant contributions to the history of Native American art 
because the image cannot be easily categorized or commodified by the art market. Instead, Whitman's street chief is effective in challenging stereotypes and its documentation of homeless urban native people in Oklahoma, which points directly to the 1952 Bureau of Indian Affairs Employment Assistant Program and other relocation programs that urged thousands of native people to relocate to urban areas where presumably jobs and housing awaited. As Vigil states in her essay, the promises of this program were not realized and out of the approximately 35,000 native people that relocated, by 1960, one third had returned to the reservations and the many that remained in urban areas lacked the community safety net that reservations and tribal culture afforded and so found themselves homeless and destitute in their new urban homes. In Whitman's photograph titled Homeland Warrior, which you see here, one can also see the results of this homelessness because the man featured has gold spray paint on his lips from huffing or sniffing the solvent from a bag to get high. As a viewer is confronted with the Street Chief series, one hopes that Durham and Fisher's aims for the We the People exhibit bears fruit. That is, since what unites all the artists in We the People is a shared experience of difference that has been defined and executed by white culture, does the street chief's gaze function subversively outside that realm to turn back on the gazer revelations about his or her own desires, expectations, and ideas about Indian culture? Or as Fisher puts it in the catalog, as we look at them, looking at us, looking at them, we might be just a little uncomfortable that our gaze so long concealed behind a dissembling rhetoric or a monocular lens is actually capable of being turned back on us. As one response to this Western dominance in the arts and culture collecting, the group show Revisions from 1992 at the Walter Phillips Gallery in Banff, Alberta, brought together eight artists from the US and Canada to draw attention to the ongoing acculturation and colonization of native peoples and its impact on their social identity. So these are some of the artists that were involved, including Durham, Heap of Birds, uh, Eddie Patra, Joan Cardinal Schubert. Revisions was actually conceived as a response to the controversial 1988 exhibition titled The Spirit Sings at the Glenbow Museum. On opening day of The Spirit Sings, 150 protesters showed up to support the Lubicon Lake Cree boycott of this exhibition because of the museum's ties to Shell Oil Canada. In the catalog for the group show Revisions, curator Helga Pakasar states, and I quote, disregarding geopolitical borders, stylistic categories, and the authentic voice, my curatorial intention was to present works that were influenced by Western postmodernism and were concerned with native history and its revisions. Durham made this piece titled On Loan from the Museum of the American Indian, in which he mocked museum displays of found objects, didactics, photographs, legends, and what he called scientifacts. And it's a parody about the distortions of ethnographic exhibits and what they make of Indian life. With display titles like Real Indian Blood and Indian Leg Bone, and this one here called Pocahontas's Panties, Durham's collection of artifacts is equally humorous and critical of Eurocentric museum practices. In the essay titled Jimmy Durham, Holding a Mirror to Humanity, Jean Fisher describes the vitrine display as a sculptural assemblage that Durham has frequently visited because its allusion to surveillance mimics the European obsession with collecting, categorizing, and higher archiving the world, not least through the violence of naming. 
As part of revisions, Edgar Heifelberg installed this billboard on top of the roof of the gallery to question why the government of Canada gets to decide who is Indian. Instead, he states that Native people recognize themselves. Another artist, Eddie Patra, made these assemblages that are described as anti-monuments and that memorialize Indian battles. But they are also compelling as personal and political responses to the genocide of Native peoples. For example, in Little Bighorn Medicine, which you see here, a postcard of General Custer on the wall is pierced with wire radiating from the four cardinal directions along with a bundled cross and sage offering gathered from the Little Bighorn site. In Small Matters, Patra has taken pages from the D. Brown book titled Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee and crumpled them into tiny fences as though in reservation plots, while white letrocyne identifies massacres like the Trail of Tears, which you can see there, or Sand Creek. Pakassar describes these small memorial sculptures as having a ceremonial quality that intensifies a sense of disappearance, forcing an, an engaged looking at what are not small matters after all. In much the same way in the area of performance art, James Luna's artifact piece at the San Diego Museum of Man problematized the ethnographic display of native peoples. Later on, as part of revisions, Rebecca Belmore also protested the display of native bodies by putting herself on display outside Thunder Bay Gallery in minus 22 degree weather, while others protested outside as well. More recently, in 2002, Belmore performed vigil to memorialize the more than 65 women that disappeared from the downtown east side area of Vancouver, British Columbia. As the poorest neighborhood in Canada, this inner city space has been conceptualized within Vancouver as an unproductive space. A majority of the women who were disappeared were First Nations women and thus were historically marginalized from the imaginary of Canadian citizenship. Here in this image, Belmore yells out the names of the victims, which she has written on her arms. In another performative example from 97 titled An Indian Act Shooting the Indian Act, Lawrence Paul Willupton traveled to London and filmed himself standing in front of Canada House, located at Trafalgar Square. Willupton then speaks to the camera and says, and I quote, I am here to finish this business of the Indian Act. This performance piece is a protest with the acts of weapons and might and power, the same hand that colonialism has used against Aboriginal people. Well, Lupton is then shown on camera firing his weapon at a paper copy of the Indian Act at Bisley Range in Surrey, England. As you can see here in this picture, the gun later on adorned with ribbons, beads, and leather, and the damaged Indian Act were on display at Grunt Gallery in Vancouver, British Columbia. In contrast to Belmore's performance practices, Willutton projects his, ang his anger by saying he was delivering a death blow to the colonial institution. The statement, he said, is made plainly, with no room for comment, interruption, or negotiation. In his book, Culture and Imperialism, literary and cultural critic Edward Said points out that the main battle in imperialism is over land, because those who kept it going, who want it back, and who now plans its future, these issues were reflected, contested, and even for a time, decided in narrative. Said goes on to argue that one of the first steps in mobilizing people in the colonial world to rise up and throw off imperial subjection was the power to narrate because it is the grand narratives of emancipation and enlightenment that stirred people 
to fight for new narratives of equality and human community. Through their work, the Native artists from the U.S. and Canada provide their viewers with new narratives of resistance against the specter of violence inherent in everyday neocolonial structures. Similarly, the artists, critics, and theorists discussed in this paper have shown tremendous resolve in the wake of social and political turmoil on both sides of the U.S. and Canadian border. Since the 1960s, Native American and Aboriginal artists have been creating work that not only expresses their personal visions, but also functions as an act of resistance against a marginalizing art world. Against the backdrop of increasing Indian activism, most of the work created in that time period from 1960 to 1990 involved tactics and artistic strategies that challenged the status quo with interventions to push the boundaries of an art world that had a limited field of vision. Native art after the postmodern era has been theorized in many new ways, most notably as an agent within the global indigenous rights movement. As Jean Fisher points out, the neo-colonial position of Native American peoples nevertheless remains a cause for concern. With limited political support or legal representation, relocation and land loss continue to threaten the well-being of many. The deliberate distribution of smallpox infected blankets have been replaced by water and crop pollution from industrial effluents and radioactive waste, threatening life itself. Without access to the existing structures of power, Strategies of survival and renegotiation are limited to the manipulation of the rhetorical space of dominant society. And regardless of what background or you know, where people come from that are native, one of the things I always try to mention is that, you know, however, you know, all these issues in the art world, that along with the considerable efforts of the cultural resistance reflected within that art world. One cannot forget the continuing efforts of the grassroots activists and elder medicine people who care for important ceremonial knowledge. Thank you. So I guess we'd have uh, comments with Shanna or questions. So we can come up here and we can share some feedback if you like. Yeah. Do you know what the main cause of death was in Europe for the victim of Wild West? Yeah, in Europe, the main cause of death, uh, a lot of it was illness. Illness because they had to camp everywhere they went, and they weren't really f fit for that climate. And then a few times they died from accidents. Uh, the one baby got run over by horses. They had a baby on display in a bag and it fell out, the baby fell out, and then the, the wagon ran over it, the baby. And then one time, the, you know, the, the leg was, was, was injured, it got to be amputated, then got infected, and uh, so there were, there were accidents within the shows, too, you know. And then some of them stayed back, and it was peculiar, but they joined circuses. I mean, America was like a very bad <laughs> place for Indians in, in Pine Ridge, so they didn't want to come back. So they stayed and had families in Europe, and are still there, there are still descendants there. You know. I, I would like to know, if, if it is known, just how, how far back in time that uh, medicine circle goes. Uh, how, how far back the medicine wheel goes? It's, yeah. uh, I would say about a thousand years uh, in Wyoming there. Um, then it would go back to other, other sites, but that's, that's a pretty active one for about 10 different nations. They still fast there. There's still a place for a ceremony at that. It's on top of that mountain. And, and it's with the, the National Forest Service, so there's a good partnership. They close it down for you to go pray. If, if, you, if, you, if you come to that, that site, they'll close it off for Native people to go. I've taken both my sons there. We've been up there. And we can find the same place we dance in that, whisk, in that circle where we dance next week. We can find the same spots. It's, it's, it's very accurate. Shanna, um, I noticed um, when you showed the uh, the poster for Confluence of Tradition, 
um, there was a, what was it, 28 artists or? 24. 24 artists. Mm -hmm. I was struck by, I, I was only familiar with really maybe three of them. And um, I'm curious about what, where, where many of those artists are today, if you know from your research. Um, well, quite a few have passed on, like uh, Billy Sosa, War Soldier. Uh, I believe Harry Fonseca was involved as well. Um, Sylvia Lark, a lot of them were just, you know, in their late 60s, 70s. So it's a, it's a generation that I think not a lot has been written about, um, let alone um, there aren't very many writers that actually, you know, interviewed them at the time and actually structured a way to exemplify their practices within the movement. Um, which is why I focus quite a bit on Jean Fisher's work. But, you know, it's a large task. She kind of focused quite a bit on Jimmy Durham and a few other artists. But I think it's a, it's a condition of the field itself in contemporary Native art, art history, et cetera, that there are more artists rather than writers. And in a lot of cases, as you saw with Durham, a lot of the Native artists had to write about the work themselves and exhibit and curate with each other. So I think uh, now, of course, in my generation, there are a lot more, uh, there's more interest and there's, there are Native writers that are coming about to kind of close that gap, but there definitely is a lot of work that still needs to be done. Question for um, Edgar about the work that was shown or is maybe permanently installed outside of the Denver Museum. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that that sculpture references a particular ceremonial structure. And I was curious that as the sculpture is a, a it's an abstraction of that particular space, you still decided you were talking about not wanting to give away too much. And you decided to take two of the structural elements that would have been originally in that structure, a way, and I, I wondered if you could maybe talk a little bit more about that. Well, the, the, I, you know, we have, we build that structure every year, so we're getting ready to build it right now, like next week, and, um, and then they tear it down. So it's about, all about renewal, renewing the earth. Uh, so we don't want to make a permanent idol or church. So the tribe is really against any, any kind of church you can have a gatekeeper for, like the Pope. You can have someone give a gatekeeper for religion. So it's really more of a fluid honoring of the environment. Uh, so, so when I made that piece, I had the chiefs come and look at it too. And they liked it, you know, but I still didn't trust it. I still didn't trust that it wasn't appropriate, you know. So I didn't want to make it a, a form you could actually, you know, build the rafters and make it happen. You know, we don't we, we don't need it. We don't need another one. We have many of them. We make them every year. So, so I really was uh, cognizant of not of not making that as a um, like an elemental form that can be used for that that ceremony, uh, and and it's turned out pretty well. It's turned out great, and that that the communities embraced it and made it made it kind of a special place from their perspective. Even with, but they know what it's kind of coming from because they they're from the prairies, so they know the the archetype. Um, but also the the nomenclature on the outside of it, the the, the notations, the Sand Creek, you know, wounded knee. Um, all these things that happened in the West, it's all, it's all encompassed there. Fort Marion, what I showed you earlier, all that's there present. So the history of, of the America, American experience in the prairies is all there. So that kind of made, I think, people more receptive to it, Native people, you know. So, so it's worked out pretty well that way, yeah. I understand that Jim, Jimmy Durham prefers not to be known as a Native American artist. Could you say anything about that? Is it that he wants to be an artist who is a Native American, or is he? <laughs> what is that? Well, it was kind of interesting, and I, I wrote that paper, um, I think maybe a year or two ago. And when I reread it again, I had to put in self described Cherokee artists. Um, because, of course, I think we've all been reading the papers that it's very controversial um, from the tribal perspective, those that are Cherokee, that 
have either um, researched enough to know that he's not on their roles, the Dawes role. So I'm not very familiar with it. I'm not a Jimmy Durham scholar, but I believe that his work stands the way it is. He's an artist, and you know other artists like George Morrison from you know this area have also said that they don't want to be known as an Indian artist. They're artists that happen to be Indian. So I think that you know their own personal preference has to be respected and. When I think about uh, Durham's work, you know, the 40 plus years that he put into it, um, and also looking at the impact that he had on various discourses, and uh, like Gene Fisher, I think that art is not reducible to identity, that it has to be seen, like she said, as a material realization of you know, a philosophical act, how you live your life. And I think at this point, because he is actively sought to live outside the U.S. and exhibit outside the U.S., which is why this is his very first retrospective, that he doesn't want to be preoccupied anymore with those debates. And as a Navajo woman myself from a very different tribe, different perspective, I feel like I don't have the right to tell someone that they're Indian or not because that's their experience and it's not my business. I know who I am, so yeah. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I'll add, I want to add something. And well, certainly I, I'm, I'm a very strong a supporter of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. I think it's a great, great law, you know, and, and it's there to protect craftspeople. It's not there for fine art. And, it's just tripped up itself in fine art, but it, that's really not even very important. It, it's more about protecting crafts workers that had imports coming in being merchandised as Native American. That's what the law was made for. So, like my necklace made by a Cheyenne artist. You know, uh, we're protecting them by that law so we can't have something from, say, Asia come over in, in big quantities made by a machine or something and be called Native American, you know. So, so that's what that law's about, and, it, and it's had some problems with being applied to fine art, but it doesn't really stop the venues from having ex exhibitions of fine art and so on. You just don't have to call it, you know, Native American. And then furthermore, I'm, I'm, I'm Shine Arapaho, a guy from, you know, from Concho, where I'm gonna go on Monday, and, uh, and so I have to abide by whatever the tribe has said to me. I mean, if, I have to be one quarter Sean Rappo to, to go there and, and be enrolled in that nation. Um, and so whatever they decide, I'll, I'll go with what they say. And so the government doesn't tell them what to say. You know, the tribe decides what, they, what to say. And so, you know, you've got to honor the, the, the nation's definition. It's not, it's not a personal decision. Um, but for me, I would go deeper and say, it's all about your sweat equity back to the community and the people, the folks. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm pretty demanding, but if you're not home working with stuff, I don't really need you to do anything because you're worthless. I mean, it's like if you're not home helping the elders, they're cold, they're hot, they don't have money to turn on the heat, they don't have a way to go to the hospital. You know, we have children that are abused. You know, we have babies that die. We've got to bury them. We need people at home to help us do these things. It's, it's, uh, that's what tribal things are about a unity of a community. It's not a it's not a book or a, a law, you know. So, and that's and that's fading. But we don't have that problem where I'm from. We, and I've been to Navajo many times too. So people know who they are. They know what they need to do, you know. And they they pitch in and help. They pray for you. They'll guide you, teach you. Uh, that's what you want to do. That's what Native America is. And there's something else outside of it that is maybe a little bit lost or misdefined. But that's just not very many of that. That's, that's, that's the exception. You know, most people are home in the communities together. You know, like tomorrow we have my sister's birthday party at my house. And all there, everyone's going to come over and we're going to get together and eat. You know, it's like that kind of experience that, that is native. You know, it's not, it's not, a, not a museum's purview, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not. Um, 
Hi, I, I just want to um, say really from the heart, thank you. What you, f to both of you, what you began with, the activism, the history, and then where you went in the next part of um, the talks, it, it showed the extension of, I think, those early years of activism and into a very deep spiritual practice, an artistic practice that is so unusual because it, it provides such healing for people by bringing a locus of attention to the past. And this real attention to history that you have was so moving to me. And I want to thank you for not, you know, disregarding the incredible intensity of emotion that, um, that history, it, it, people go in and out of history. And when you provide a place for people to honor their ancestors or our ancestors, and you bring attention to it in this really beautiful way, it does a lot for people. And so I just want to thank you. Thank you, Louise. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for those words. Thanks. All right. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Oh. And there's cards here if you want a card. There's a card for everybody. If you'd like to have a print, you can have.